I hand over um, Jürgen Korka. It is a special evening also for him. Yesterday there was a round anniversary, but I don't tell you which one because um, you wouldn't guess. Um, but anyway, I'm so glad that you're with us and um, you know, looking forward to your lecture about capitalism. Thank you, Philip. And good luck to everybody with this new institution. It's an honor to give one of the first lectures here. So good evening, everybody from Berlin. Transformations of uh, capitalism, Wittgenstein, uh, Vienna, uh, Rezet. In this context, I thought a talk about transformation of capitalism may well start with an idea of Joseph, Joseph Schumpeter, the great Austrian-American uh, economist, social scientist. I quote, the fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion revolutionizes the economic structure from within, is incessantly destroying the old one, and uh, increase incessantly creating the new one. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. I think Schumpeter has a point. Transformation is the essence of uh, capitalism. Capitalism is an arrangement which partly creates, partly copes with, partly always deals with economic and social transformation. This is why it is so indispensable, that this is why it's so attractive to some and why it is rejected by so many. And maybe that's also why it needs to be embedded. But today I will not deal with transformation as a core of capitalism directly. Rather, I want to talk about uh, long-term transformations of capitalism in order to place the most recent decades, uh, which as I understand will be the major topic of this research institute, into a broader framework of uh, intertemporal comparison. I will concentrate on Europe, uh, although not exclusively. I will be selective in order to stay within my time limit of about 45 minutes. So the concept of capitalism emerged in some European languages in the second half of the 19th century. But historians and social scientists who used it have never refrained from also applying it to earlier periods in which such a concept did not yet exist. And I will do the same. The concept emerged when industrial capitalism became dominant, when capitalist industrialization took place and when it inspired the fantasies and uh, influenced the ideas and shaped uh, key concepts uh, of the time. But even then and ever since, uh, authors have also dealt with other variants of capitalism, especially with merchant capitalism, agrarian capitalism, finance capitalism, and most recently plantation capitalism. And I will do the same. The concept capitalism has an interesting history in itself, oscillating between polemics and analysis, uh, uh, between political speech and uh, scholarly use, uh, between different meanings. There is no full consensus about the meaning uh, of the concept. There never was. Let me define what I have in mind when using the word capitalism. I emphasize decentralization, commodification, and accumulation. First, it's essential that individual and collective actors have robust uh, rights, usually property rights, uh, 
which enable them to make economic decisions uh, in a relatively autonomous and decentralized uh, way. Second, markets. Markets, the price system, competition, serve as the main mechanism of allocation and, dist and coordination. So commodification permeates capitalism in many ways. And thirdly, capital is essential. That means utilizing resources of the present you, in the, for investment in the present with the expectation uh, of higher gains in the future. Using for this purpose credit, uh, besides savings and returns, dealing with uncertainty because it's the future and risk because it's the future, as well as aiming at profit and uh, accumulation. So there's a certain relationship between present and future, certain temporality built into capitalist actions. So change, growth and expansion are inscribed, although in irregular rhythms with ups and downs uh, interrupted by crisis. By capitalism, I mean an economic practice or sometimes economic system with social, political and cultural conditions and consequences. The concept is good for bringing together economic, social, cultural, political dimensions. It is this interrelation between economic, social, political and cultural dimension which interests many of us most. But it's important to understand that capitalist economies can be and have been interrelated with rather different and changing social, cultural, and political contexts. In order to trace basic transformation of capitalism over time, I will talk about two themes mainly. First on the changing nature of work in capitalism. And second on the changing relationship between state and market, market and state. Hope to close with some general remarks. So first, transformations of work uh, in capitalism. Contrary to what many of us uh, used to hold some time ago, I want to emphasize um, that free contractual work for wages, Lohnarbeit, is not always the normal or the most likely form of dependent work in capitalism. Take two types of capitalist work in the field of production in the era before industrialization as examples. Uh, on the one hand, proto-industrialization. On the other hand, plantation capitalism in the 18th, both in the 18th century. In Europe, the most important gateway for capitalism to extend its principles beyond the sphere of commerce and finance where it had been effective for a long time, extended from there into the world of production, the, the most important way for this transfer was in proto-industrial cottage industries. Throughout the early modern period and far into the 19th century, this was a tension-filled symbiosis between two different ways of uh, organizing production. On the one hand, traditional forms of artisanal handicraft, mostly in the countryside and performed within a family and household or household unit, one part of the mixture. On the other hand, uh, there was the element of mostly urban merchant capital, 
its supra regional market orientation and its capitalist dynamism. In the course of implementing this uh, connection, the participating merchant became a verleger, that is a merchant entrepreneur with influences uh, on production, on production which nevertheless uh, stayed decentralized. And the immediate uh, producers uh, became dependent on these merchant entrepreneurs and these merchant capitalists. They were integrated into the spreading capitalist system of distribution over large spaces and distances, even transnational, uh, transatlantic, um, <clears throat> especially in textiles, uh, metal productions, furniture production, other fields. Handwerker became Heimarbeiter, but they stayed and worked within family and household contexts. They retained more than nominal independence in varying degrees, uh, according to varying relations between them and the merchant entrepreneurs. Many of them continued uh, to own their tools and even machines. Proto-industrial cottage industries can serve, that's a more general point, can serve as an excellent example for illustrating how capitalist practices gradually intrude into traditional non-capitalist structures, uh, utilizing and changing them step by step. So creative destruction in the sense of Schumpeter can take the form of long-term restructuring instead of abrupt breaks. Outside Europe, the triumph of early modern capitalism in many colonies led to a massive increase of unfree labor. The production of staple goods like sugar, rice, tobacco, cotton, tea, spices in South and Central America, in India and in Southeast Asia, elsewhere, was usually organized in the plantation system. It was largely initiated and exploited by investors, merchants, and trading companies from the colonizing countries, directed according to capitalist principles clearly, mostly for export, and largely based on unfree labor. Unfree labor by slaves, by indentured servants, uh, and other bonded laborers. Slaves, of course, had been made into a commodity in a very basic, extreme, and debasing, humanly debasing manner. But on the plantation, the relationship between slaveholder and slave was not one in which labor power was exchanged for wages between formerly equal participants in the labor market. Rather, it was a relationship of extreme inequality between owner and property. In many areas, plantation slavery remained highly profitable as late as the 19th century. The employment of slaves was not abundant, usually owing to its economic inferiority. Rather, it was banned under political pressure. Capitalism, and that's the more general point in that, capitalism is evidently compatible at least for a time and under certain conditions with different ways of organizing and exploiting work. This piece of its history, plantation uh, capitalism, shows that capitalism per se contains little in the way of resistance against inhumane practices. But it also shows that capitalism is compatible with such resistance when subjected 
to legal political restrictions and uh, cultural pressure. Back to the changing forms of, capital, of work in capitalism. In the course of the long 19th century and related to the rise of enterprise-based enterprise um, industrial capitalism, wage work on a contractual basis, Lohnarbeit, became a mass phenomenon, although in many, many shades and different combinations and forms. It was dependent work, relatively free of non-economic compulsion done by workers who did not own the tools and materials they used and shaped performed within an employment uh, relationship that is a legally supported uh, arrangement allowing and requiring the exchange of labor power and of limited sub subordination against wages, against predictable wages, an arrangement which can, could, can be terminated both by employers and by employees, and Marx gave the classical analysis of this. Wage work became again in many forms and shades and through many conflicts, the prevailing type of dependent work under capitalism because it corresponded best to the particular kind of instrumental rationality inherent to capitalist enterprise, because also it matched the laws and the requirements of a constitutional state and its more or less liberal principles of citizenship. And because its rise, the rise of Lohnarbeit was facilitated or required by additional socioeconomic factors typical for the and typical for industrial capitalism. Among these factors, let me just mention two. A relatively developed labor market offering choices to both sides and industrialization, which required and led to a new spatial and institutional separation of household family on one side, gainful market related work erwerbsarbeit on the other. Quite in contrast to what had been common in previous centuries. Due to industrialization and urbanization, a specialized space of market related work emerged in workshops in mines and factories in administrations and schools, commercial, financial and cultural institutions. A space related to but clearly distinguished and differentiated from the sphere of family and household, which in turn, a sphere of family, family and household, which in turn became more private, less defined by gainful market related work, more removed from capitalism. This process of differentiation. This process of basic divergence had tremendous social and political consequences. Once work in the sense of Erwerbsarbeit took place in a relatively separate sphere of its own, it could be perceived and experienced uh, and evaluated as something distinct, as a distinct activity in contrast to non-work. It was here that work in the sense of Erwerbsarbeit could serve as a medium of communication and uh, of mutual recognition of conflict and cooperation with colleagues and uh, superiors uh, and uh, um, subordinates. 
as a place in which work-related social bonding uh, and distancing uh, could take place, which in turn helped to create, to create identities uh, and structure social relations such as between classes. Class formation, the essence, class formations, the emergence of what we call Arbeitsgesellschaft, work society, and the rise of powerful labor movements would probably not have been possible without wage work becoming a mass phenomenon and not without the spatial institutional differentiation between family household and the world of gainful work. But this is a constellation of the past, which perhaps still informs our core concepts more than it should. In the 20th century, particularly the late 20th century and in the 21st century, different developments have come together in transforming the world of gainful work without abandoning the basic rules of capitalism. Everybody is aware of some of these developments in our part of the world. Technological change, redefining the division of labor, redefining single activities and the forms of coordination between them within firms and in, at the society, in the society at large. The role of labor laws and welfare state deeply influencing the relations between employers and employees. The relative decline of the industrial work in post-industrial societies related to, to new patterns of division of labor on the global scale. The impact of digitalization and new fragmentation of labor in space and time. And in other parts of the world, especially the global south, the growing mass of so-called informal labor, in many ways traditional, in other ways highly dependent on and defined by global capitalism. Let me finish this first part of my lecture by concentrating only on one of the many consequences of digitalization, which to me appears to be exemplary and paradigmatic, the rise of what in German we call home office, remote work, telework, working from home. The Corona crisis has accelerated and dramatized a trend which has been on the way since the 1980s, the partial return of Erwerbsarbeit into the space of family and household made possible and advanced by digitalized forms of communication. Right now, about one third of the labor force is performing at least major part of their work duties at home. As a historian, one is reminded of the proto-industrial cottage industries, which I mentioned before, although it's very different. We expect that this transformation of work will be turned back after the corona crisis ends only partly. This is in my mind a major tectonic shift to be continued in the future with major social consequences. The intrusion of gainful employment and market related work and sooner or later, and you already can feel it, sooner or later all legal and administrative provisions to protect and regulate this form of decentralized work, this introduces reintegration into the home is having an effect on the family and the household. There will be less separation between family life and the pressures of capitalism and government regulation. Family life will become less private 
where the boundaries between private life and the world of work blurring even more. On the other hand, work removed from the spaces of offices and workshops is becoming more individualized. A sort of deinstitutionalization is taking place. Work is losing some of its socializing for Gesellschaft and the work is losing some of its socializing power. A power cannot be this power cannot be exercised without intensive contacts with colleagues, uh, superiors and subordinates and others. The importance of work as a basis for building identities will be further reduced. It will be further replaced by other, more particularistic dimensions of social belonging and orientation. Culture, imagined origins, imagined origins, nationality, and perhaps gender and age. New forms of inequality are gaining ground for instance, between those who are sufficiently qualified or from the management perspective, sufficiently trustworthy to enjoy the right to work from home and those who are not. Classical cleavages between along class lines, for instance, play a remarkably minor role right now in the present discussions about telework they have faded into the background. Now all this happens without changing the basic principles of capitalism as, if, as I tried to define them at the beginning. Capitalism proves flexible enough, not only to tolerate, but actually to promote this sort of transformation. And I hope reset will be able to study this in a comparative way. So let me move to my second uh, and last uh, topic, market and state. If we want to place the present in a long time perspective, uh, it's useful to look at the changing relations between market and state. Countries differ with respect to the way in which state and market are related to each other. The varieties of capitalism literature, for instance, uses aspects of the state market relationship as major yardsticks, criteria for comparing capitalist systems internationally. And the most heated political and ideological fights about capitalism have always centered on the question, how much state, how much market, and how should the two sides be related? Just remember the controversies uh, during the Cold War or consider the literature on neoliberalism more recently. Relations between market and state are changing in the course of time. And classic books, classic treatises like Polanyi's Great Transformation of 1944 had much to say about the relations between state and market and how they have developed and how they should be framed. Taking these points together, these are good reasons for using the last minutes of this lecture for this topic. As to state market uh, relations, we may, especially with respect to the West, distinguish between four phases within the period from the early 19th century to the present time. It's true, the contributions made by state governments to the economic and social development within their areas were, was always very considerable. There is no reason to talk about night watchmen states, Nachtwächterstaaten, they didn't exist. But if compared with the mercantilist policies of 
and the corporate structures of previous centuries, or with uh, interventionism, the state interventionism of later decades, the half century between the 1820s and the 1870s was in par large parts of Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, a period of economic liberalism and of deregulation under the banner of free trade in several countries and internationally. By and large, governments tried to promote the self-propelling dynamism of the emerging market economies, state support for welfare remained minimal, and the liberal belief in individual freedom as something useful for all was strong. The 1870s and 1880s brought a change. Economic and social policy interventions started in some countries earlier than in others, reaching, for instance, in Germany, from and Austria and the Habsburg Empire as well, from protective tariff legislation and the nationalization of railroads to obligatory insurance systems and the beginning of a welfare state. At the same time, the self organization of economic and social actors advanced, cartels, as an example very close cooperation between banks and industrial enterprises, the rise of managerial capitalism, organized interest groups, these are examples for self-organization on the society level. And these tendencies, both from above and from below, supported one another. Historians have spoken of the beginnings of organized capitalism before and directly after 1900. And these changes were reactions on the one hand to the serious international crisis of capitalism since 1873. On the other hand, they re these changes responded to growing social tensions and especially to the rise of organized labor. They also served purposes of nation building and national strength in that period of early globalization and high imperialism. Then World War I further promoted a comprehensive non-market organization of capitalism. The protectionism of the interwar period moved the international system even further away from uh, uh, free trade from the free trade era of the 19th century and the world economic crisis of uh, the 1930s uh, strengthened again the inclination of states to intervene to intervene in economic and social processes so this interventionism assumed severely anti-liberal forms in the dictatorship of Europe and Japan, but it respected constitutional and democratic criteria in the American New Deal. After the Second World War, to be sure the war economy's uh, compulsory measures uh, were largely removed, but in the third quarter of the 20th century, we observe an expansion of the welfare state and of labor legislation, cooperation between organized interest groups and state agencies, economic policy increasingly tailored to Keynesian uh, standards, a stronger role for nationalized sectors of the economy and some overall government planning some intergovernmental coordination at the global level. So the third quarter of the 20th century was the high point of organized capitalism so far. 
the third, uh, some observers and scholars at the time even talked about the emergence of a mixed economy. The Cold War gave this debate an additional momentum since the communist uh, challenge repeatedly stimulated capitalists' readiness and capitalism's um, capacity for reform. In the late 1970s, however, a third phase began, a phase of revived market capitalism, to use the language of Charles Mayer. Neoliberal theories praised the self-regulating forces of the market, a deliberate thrust towards deregulation and privatization took place along with a certain retrenchment in social welfare services, serving, reserve, reversing the trend line of the previous decades. So the causes of this shift still need further investigation. Of course, there were the end of the Bretton Woods uh, system, there were the oil crisis of the 70s, the end of what has been called the Trente Glorieuse, the period between the 1950s and the mid 1970s. So the economic crisis of the 1970s, remember stagflation, high unemployment, demonstrated the limits and perhaps the internal contradictions of organized capitalism. We must take serious that organized capitalism had been built up and practiced uh, within the boundaries of nation states. Now, however, globalization advanced together with increased global competition, which meant considerable pressure on the old industrial countries with high wages and labor, labor costs. And the zeitgeist also changed uh, away from organization and plan leading values or catchwords um, towards individualization, diversity, spontaneity. The collapse of the Eastern Bloc was interpreted as proving that market forces were superior to planning. Moreover, the collapse of the Soviet bloc removed the great challenge of a non-capitalist alternative, which during the Cold War, as I said, had increased the willingness of major actors in the West to back a more welfare conscious uh, social market economy, soziale Marktwirtschaft, as a way of forestalling more radical change. I'm not sure whether we should speak about the following three decades or so as a neoliberal era. Certainly, pioneered by the US under Reagan and the UK under Thatcher, deregulation gained ground internationally, especially in the field of finance and in close alliance with the processes of financialization. Social protection and other welfare state functions were curtailed in many highly developed countries. Inequality grew. Statism was checked, though not only by strengthening market forces, but also by strengthening the rights and the dynamics of civil society, and that's something different. Globalization of capitalism advanced, propelled forward by relatively unbridled market dynamics without being checked or embedded by powerful transnational political structures, which anyway hardly existed and hardly exist. The implosion of the communist bloc gave way to an abrupt, largely unregulated upsurge of radical market capitalism in the former East, or in the East, uh, at least for some years after 1990. Very different, of course, from anything 
like organized capitalism or social market economy has partly developed in the context of Rhenish capitalism in previous decades. Yet, there are many counterexamples. Throughout, throughout these decades, social welfare expenditures calculated as proportion of GNP did not shrink, but steadily grew in several countries like Germany. The US-UK model was not fully followed in many parts of the world, certainly not in East Asia. And if we look into the type of crony capitalism, which in the late 90s took over in parts of Eastern Europe, we observe this intimate alliance between capitalist and state power, which clearly contradicts the principles of a liberal or a neoliberal market economy. Sometimes one gets the impression that neoliberalism is much more a construct either of some kind of economic theory or of critics of capitalism more than a historical reality. To the extent that it existed at all, neoliberalism has been further weakened and even replaced, I believe, in the last of the four periods I want to distinguish. The international financial crisis of 2008 and 9 has profoundly shaken the foundations of neoliberalism's legitimation, both politically and intellectually. Without doubt, deregulation of the financial sector was one of the causes of the financial collapse of 2008. Core convictions of neoliberalism as to the autonomy and the self regulating capacity of markets were disclaimed and discredited by key actors of finance capitalism themselves when they, in the crisis of 2008, pleaded with national governments to stave off their final collapse, not without success. And in the following years, in many ways and in different parts of the world, both domestically and internationally, the role of political decisions and political power has steadily grown again, relative to and partly at the cost of market forces and of civil society. One can, can observe this in Europe and in China, but also in the United States. And the Corona crisis has accelerated this ongoing trend towards more state. Another example showing that the present crisis is mainly a period of acceleration and not a turning point, nor a seedbed for new departures. But the present crisis also shows the severe limitations of what state politics or state policies and their administrative implementation can ultimately achieve. Let me finish with a very few general remarks. First, from a long-term historical perspective, it seems clear that the need for state interventions into market economies has grown in the long run and will continue to further grow. Several reasons, markets which make capitalist conduct possible in the first place, presuppose framework conditions that can only be established by political means. Also, we observe the growing instability of capitalist processes which demands stabilization by social and political means, by non-market mechanisms offered by civil society and by governments. And even in its advanced stages, or perhaps particularly in its advanced stages, 
capitalism developed in a way that has disruptive and destructive effects on its social, cultural, and political environment, and sometimes calls into question its social acceptance. So capitalism needs to be socially and politically embedded to use this concept of Polanyi, not only in order to be compatible with norms of our civilization, but also in order to survive. Second, Herr Kocker, Sie haben sich gemutet. Oh, danke. I hope you got my first point on capitalism. Yeah. Now the second point, thank you. The second point, I hope that Reset will deal with a comparative historical analysis of capitalism. And I think it will be and is, as I heard already, a particular strength of this research institution to be able to include East Central and Eastern European topics into the tableau of um, areas to be considered. And this opens up specific opportunities, I'm convinced. For instance, the ZZ should take serious that the economic crisis of the mid 1970s um, occurred not only in the West, but also in the East. Ivan Berendt, uh, the great Hungarian American economic historian, has tentatively identified this crisis as a Schumpeterian uh, structural crisis to which Western economies reacted with creative destruction, returning to a more market radical form of capitalism for a while with all its flaws. While the non-capitalist economies under Soviet hegemony for the East were not flexible enough to perform a similar transformation and started their decline or accelerated it if it already existed. That's an interesting hypothesis, which deserves to be checked and further developed, and which of course would not only tell us something new about what happened in the East, but also what happened in the West. Another example, knowledgeable authors like Philip Thea have described the precipitous um, rush to free market capitalism in the East, right after the end of communism in the early 90s. It's wild nature, it's instrumentalization by Western capitalists and entrepreneurs. It's destructive, basically destructive character and it's very problematic political consequences in the middle long run. It was a hasty move towards capitalism without any political and social embeddedness in a constellation in which strong states did not exist and could not play a monitoring and controlling role. And this I think is a lesson on where unorganized capitalism without social and political embeddedness can lead. Something to keep in mind for the general history of modern capitalism. A last example. From its comparative angle, Reset, Reset, Reset will want to take serious that capitalism can function and even flourish in different political systems under liberal democratic conditions of different kind, but also under authoritarian or autocratic, if not outright dictatorial, conditions. Political structures, actions and values, political, the po politics, uh, co-determine not only the economic efficiency, but also the civilizational meaning of different capitalisms. <laughs> 
in the past, in the present, in the future. Capitalism can serve very different aims. And a lot depends on the political community, its aims and its strengths in which these different capitalisms exist. That's a great topic for historical studies and certainly also for political discussions. Finally, the need to transform partly results from endo endogenous developments inside capitalism, technological, etc., contradictions between the means of productions and the relations of productions, to use Marx's words. But frequently the need for transformation is induced by challenges from outside capitalism, although many of these outside challenges, these exogenous challenges have partly been influenced and generated by previous capitalist inputs and system of interdependence, of course. So will capitalism be able to change enough in order to deal with the Anthropocene specific challenges we are facing? particularly the climate crisis and the changing relations between civilization and nature? Will it be possible under the conditions of digitalization and increasing global competition to keep or to make capitalist dynamics compatible with the principles of our liberal democratic order? It is neither guaranteed nor excluded that capitalism will sufficiently will be sufficiently flexible in order to respond to the needs of the future, to the needs the future will either present or dramatize or intensify. But historical analysis shows the remarkable flexibility of capitalism, its capacity to deal with ever new transformations and a better alternative is hard. It's not easy to pin down. So thank you very much for your patience. Okay, thank you very much. Well, there's a symbol in uh, on Zoom for clapping hands. I will not use it, I will simply clap. Um, thanks a lot for this wonderful, um, intriguing and um, intensive lecture. And um, well, yes, it was long, but um, but so intensive that I listened uh, for all the time um, with uh, gratefulness and of course also with some uh, questions in mind. So we will have time, ample time for discussion. However, before we get to the uh, discussion, um, uh, Zoom I think forces us to change the mode of uh, of a lecture and then the discussion a little bit. Um, thank you for being with us. I mean, you, Jürgen Kocka, but also the entire audience uh, for already woo, almost one and a half hours. Um, I think we should have a little break. However, for this break, we will not just make um, a regular break. I mean, for this occasion, not so much for celebrating our opening, but for celebrating your anniversary, your birthday from yesterday, Usually, you know, we are in Vienna, uh, so the obligation would be to present the string quartet. Now, uh, string quartets <laughs> is not as bad as singing, but uh, difficult. And so what we did uh, for the occasion for us and for you is uh, we asked a Czech music producer um, to produce something like, you can say, a sound installation, which will be about capitalism, um, then about you, um, Jürgen Kocka, and um, uh, some past speeches and the applause you were getting and which you deserve. So we will have, um, everybody stay tuned, okay, don't leave us. Uh, we will now play this sound installation, um, a small piece of art, so to say, culture, much needed in times of Corona. Um, and it will last for roughly four minutes and then you know you can all relax uh, get some air and then we will reconvene for the discussion very soon and 
four or five minutes. And um, Irena, um, by the way, uh, she our managing director, and I didn't thank her yet. Thanks for preparing all this. Thanks also to Yanis Paniagutidis um, for everything. Um, and anyway, now the, um, uh, the, the sound installation by Peter Kappeler. Modernisierungstheoretischen Denkens hat das nicht geführt. Die Kritik an diesem Denken blieb und bleibt stark an seinem pro-westlichen Bias, an seinem, begrifflichen, seinem angeblichen begrifflichen Schematismus, seiner angeblichen Blindheit für Widersprüche, Alternativen und Vielfalt. Die Zäsur von 1989, 91 hat das Denken und die Praxis der Historiker beeinflusst. Ich bin einigen dieser Auswirkungen aus einer deutschen und europäischen Perspektive nachgegangen und wurde man dies aus der Perspektive anderer Weltteile tun, käme ein anderer Vortrag hervor. Und ich bin sicher, dass Beiträge zu dem heutigen Thema aber auch der Vortrag von So this was the sound installation, so to say, the, uh, also the sound of transformation and, the, and the, well, um, a piece of culture which is coming out of the most recent period of transformation because it is in the 1990s that really uh, this, this, this uh, culture of music sampling uh, got really, got, um, you know, uh, took off. So uh, applause to... Yeah, it, I just want to say thank you very much. And it certainly was not a musical uh, translation of organized capitalism. No, we don't. We don't live in. An, do we still live in an age of organized capitalism? <laughs> we don't live in it either. Yeah. Uh, we could discuss about it. Well, anyway, so um, uh, applause to Peter Kappeler, the producer, but above all to Jürgen Korkan uh, once more. Um, and now. We'll come to the discussion uh, since um, uh, we already, you know, um, 
listening to a while, I will I will refrain from a um, uh, from a lengthy compilation of this uh, uh, great lecture. Um, of course, you know this. You tipped on so many topics which are worth discussing, and um, I also thought that these insights on Corona capitalism, you know, how it can be um, historicized as parallels to the 18th century, I found it really intriguing. Um, mm -hmm. So these historical parallels, maybe history is really um, uh, not moving forward, but um, returning in cycles, as uh, the young Marx once observed, right? Um, a second observation. Um, based on this, or maybe a question, um, is of course still, if you look at this third quarter uh, of organized and embedded capitalism, maybe it was all over really exceptional. And you know what we're living in right now um, after the 90s, but also after the global financial crisis, that is maybe just the normal thing and that there's a, a service sector proletariat, I mean, not even workers, but a different kind of proletariat, also maybe much more similar to early, earlier proletariats. So that might be worth discussing, but, um, and a third, well, a third thought I had is, I had is uh, since the crisis um, and this fiscal and, and uh, central bank policies with negative interest, in, uh, interest rates, I always keep on thinking if central banks install negative interest rates, then indeed uh, our old imagination of capitalism and capital accumulation is not valid anymore, or um, it is being transformed. But these were just very three uh, observations. And um, I don't want to suggest that we should discuss, discuss on these lines. I'll simply open the floor uh, to the audience. And so uh, we still have a, a big number of participants, 76 after one and a half hours. Um, that is record breaking, I think. And um, and there's two ways. Yes, either you put the plus into the chat to discuss, to take part in the discussion. Um, you can, of course, also take the hand function offered by Zoom. Both is fine. So now I'm asking for statements, questions. Uh, let's have a lively discussion. Um, who is first? Are there any pluses? Not yet. Um, ah, okay, now they're coming in, very good. Um, so, um, Christian Heitmann is first and then Tanya Koti, please. Yes, thanks. I do have one question uh, regarding your mention that basically um, this idea of neoliberalism is something which was often said mostly by critics of capitalism, but not really, um, well, it, it was hardly found on the ground or at least not to the extent as it was claimed. And I'm right now working on a paper writing about Slovakia and uh, comparing Slovakia in the 1990s and early 2000s with Ukraine. And when we, for example, look at Ukraine, we can see that many um, things which should be a part of capitalism, like, for example, opening um, the land um, and basically um, making possible to uh, accumulate land and to buy and sell land uh, via a land reform was never implemented or is being implemented now as of uh, November 2020, but uh, we did not really see it in the 1990s or the early 2000s. So my question is whether uh, one could say that, uh, for example, the economic problems we could have seen uh, were problems caused by socialism and basically the lack of investment in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, which basically had to um, come to, to uh, bear its fruits in the 1990s, uh, not depending on whether there came a wave of neoliberal, neoliberalism, but only based on uh, the decades before that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, should we take one more or um, should we, uh, would you like, would you prefer to answer first? It, it's up to you, Jürgen. Uh, 
Well, I mean, um, if I understand uh, Eidmann's uh, question correctly, uh, and uh, in addition, my knowledge of uh, both Slovakia and the Ukraine is poor. Um, I would say um, that in this period, then apparently the marketization of land was uh, limited, was blocked, what did not occur, uh, but occurred much later. Now, you said in the 20s. So that would be uh, an indicator, or I would interpret this uh, uh, information as, uh, as an indicator for the limited um, realization of uh, a neoliberal order. Uh, uh, and uh, along the line, which I alluded to that sometime, very often there are elements in reality which do not fit into this model of neoliberalism, if it is defined at all, frequently it's not defined. What, but why such a non uh, marketization of land uh, 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 is the fact or occurs or stays on, I would not know. Maybe, I mean, uh, very traditionally land is uh, something, uh, uh, is not a commodity, but uh, is somehow related to uh, traditional forms of uh, belonging of a corporatist uh, feudal uh, type. I mean, at least in the 18th and early 19th century in Central Europe, in Germany, uh, this changes quickly in the 19th century, but I'm sure that further east in, in Russia, at least uh, this uh, stays much longer being not really fully commodi commodified. So uh, whether this is one reason or whether, as you alluded, it is due to the um, impact of a non-market socialist system of the uh, period between the 1950s and the 1980s, I do not know. But as I would say in terms of which I mentioned today, it supports what you said, supports my suspicion that very often neoliberalism is not taking place. That's the same one point. And I just want to say a word to uh, Philip's, uh, Philip Thiers uh, ideas. Um, this is an interesting question. What is more exceptional? Is it uh, is the third quarter of the 20th centuries, these trans um, the exception, organized capitalism, tariff, I mean, the West. Uh, a certain degree of social welfare, uh, organized capitalism, a close interrelationship between politic and market, with a lot of civil society uh, in the middle. Is this the exception? Or, I mean, let me or offer the alternative in the long run. We see a tendency towards increasing state intervention into the economy. And the last years, I mean, I haven't read much about that. I don't see the article or the book, which I could quote for that. But just as a newspaper reader, as an observer of the last 20 years, I'm impressed how much state intervention happens in all kinds of things, in Germany at least. But what I read for about Trump and now his successor in the United States also fits. And China, of course, uh, goes in this direction more and more statism and control in contrast to what we hoped 10 years ago would happen there or 15 years ago. So, I mean, this tendency towards more state intervention was perhaps only shortly interrupted by this so-called neoliberal phase. And the normal trend is going on in the direction of more interrelation uh, between both. And basically, I believe that this is the case. This is not necessarily a hopeful information, but maybe uh, likely information. And very shortly, 
I would welcome very much if anybody in the in the in the round would be ready to interpret the meaning of negative interest rates and what that means for our theories and stories about capitalism. Well, I'm I, I'm I'm not a fiscal historian. I mean, there are some yeah, colleagues, uh, but so we need to leave it to them probably. Uh, but it seems to be a novelty, um, yes. as, as far as I know, it is really a novelty. Yeah. Um, just one word, Schumpeter says capitalism begins in I think 13th century or the 14th century, when people granted credit and picked up credit for future investments. Of course, that makes only sense as long as money is scarce, that you need somebody to give you credit. and pay for him in interest, et cetera. If it turns around, if there's so much money that nobody knows what to do with it, I mean, this doesn't work anymore. So I'm also a bit confused about this development. But, but being confused is productive. I think that's very good. Okay, let's, uh, let, let's return to the, to the audience. Or oh, maybe, you know, uh, uh, the colleagues who pose a question, may, maybe briefly introduce yourself, at least just, to, you know, mention the institution you're working for. Uh, Tanya Kotick, you're next. Uh, well, hello, my name is Tanya Kotick. I'm a PhD student at the University of Graz in contemporary history. And uh, I'm working on a project on a Chinese enterprise structures, but it, I'm also dealing uh, with uh, transformation of global capitalism, like I want to take a look on the historical context of how did enterprises develop uh, in global capitalism and uh, how does Chinese enterprise development relate to this and uh, I found your uh, um, presentation really interesting and I was just wondering how to adapt all this information and knowledge to the case of China for example if you're talking about the, uh, capitalism becoming more disorganized in the Western hemisphere, for example, and also due to digitalization, um, work is entering the home again. And then you look at China where industrial capitalism is still happening on a large scale, like they produce 90% of all electronic goods, which they export. And the most, most uh, enterprises in key sectors or which are globally acting, they are still state-owned enterprises. The managers are appointed with the nomenclatura system. There are overlappings with the communist party. And yeah, my, my question would be, uh, I would be interested in Mr. Cocker, how you would uh, categorize China. Uh, is For you, is China a capitalist system? And if you would say it is a capitalist system, like uh, what kind of capitalism? Like how would you categorize this? Also maybe in the, in the context of global capitalism. Yeah, I'm... Again, I uh, must say that I'm reading about China and uh, um, I'm trying to publish again on, in, a, on, in a broad sense about the history of capitalism. And here in this book, I was deal with uh, China uh, much more. And it is a decisive case. Uh, in many ways uh, for any argumentation. And my argumentation today was uh, again, rather Europe uh, or the West centered, although I made some glance, I had some glances into the uh, colonial world of first and then in the non-Western parts. Uh, usually we see, in contrast to the self-description of mo many Chinese, uh, we see what ha has happened and uh, ha what has emerged in China since uh, the 90s, uh, or 80s, 90s, as a form of state capitalism. And also some specialists, as you know, uh, better than me, uh, of Chinese economy, say, uh, categorize it this way and contrast it both with uh, market uh, 
uh, radical capitalism uh, in the United States and this kind of uh, more um, uh, uh, moderate uh, form of uh, organized, uh, more or less uh, organized capitalism in large parts of the European continent, particularly in Scandinavia and Germany and uh, Netherlands and France, state, uh, state capitalism. But I, defining uh, capitalism with these three criteria with which I started. I have no, uh, I think that the second criterion market clearly is present in China, not in every respect. And there are areas which don't function according to market principles. And the third uh, uh, criterion, um, uh, capital investment, future-oriented investment, uh, growth, etc. of course, is also working. Certain elements going with that, namely uh, inequality, or tremendous inequality, is also present in, the, in China. But the first criterion, rights, robust rights, mostly property rights, in order to guarantee that economic actors can make economic decisions in a relatively autonomous and uh, decentralized way. There, i uh, not sure what to say, and I will study more of this. I mean, there must be a point at which it becomes uh, at which the state influence and the compulsory uh, mechanisms and the reduction of individual and collective autonomy becomes so strong that one wonders whether one should call it capitalism. At least I would argue along these lines. For me, capitalism, one of the big advantages and one of the civilizational values of capitalism is the basic division of power between those who rule and those who make business and this is a very basic thing i mean uh, and come and and has been uh, it's an undervalued and underestimated element of capitalism but of course once this is uh, relativized because there is so close intimacy and uh, even identification between the top persons in uh, the uh, economy and the top persons in the political system of rulership, then this is gone. And this has an old discussion. Bordel has a lot to say about this in early modern period. And I think uh, I, I'm not sure how I will come out on that. If this is very strong, if this is very, to, a, to a very high degree politicized decisions, then I would tend to speak about an übergangssituation, about a situation of transition between capitalism and something else. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for the, for the question and for the answer. And um, um, it's Ms. Kotick. Tomorrow there will be a roundtable on East Asian capitalism. So please, you know, join us again because then we will talk about these paradoxes. How can it be right to combine uh, a strengthening one-party rule, uh, which is, has become more um, suppressive, one may say, um, with on the other hand uh, a development of let's say entrepreneurship whether it is original capitalism that that's a question and then there's of course the question of where is the who are the entrepreneurs but anyway this will be discussed uh, tomorrow at five so please join us again okay and tell anybody else who's uh, studying with you china it's uh, and thanks for digging in from graz i'm glad about that um, um thanks now we have two more questions um um from, I think we, we will take them together. Um, it is Janos Kovac and um, well, one of, um, a member of our board and a very dear, dear colleague who is running this project um, from uh, Bukharin to Bajcerovic. So um, about economic um, thinking in, uh, in Eastern Europe, but of course it goes beyond that. And then there will be Anna Kalori, 
um, who is who is joining us, uh, who will be joining us soon, and she's working on um, on textile industries, and uh, both of them are comparative. Drezet, as I mentioned, is a comparative institution, of course, within regions, but also between uh, grand regions. Um, okay, now the two of you, please, Janusz and, and, and Anna, go ahead. Janusz, are you still muted? I don't see that. Um... Okay, do you hear me? Okay. So, Professor Koka, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question has nothing to do with uh, with uh, Bukharin or Balcerovich. This is about the industrial industrial revolution. It 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 somehow puzzled me or or surprised me that when you were talking about the explanatory factors of emerging capitalism, somehow you you skip this this factor. I mean, technological change, uh, the, the emergence of large enterprises. If you want to, we can put it in Marxist terms, concentration of capital, uh, the increase of the organic composition of capital, things like that. So do you have a special reason why you were disregarding this issue? Also the, the issue of, of minimizing transaction costs as a as an explanation for uh, for uh, the emergence of large enterprises which was a, a very important issue in new economic history from uh, north to i don't know to to amber green so is there a special reason why you were um, ignoring or neglecting or you thought that this is so evident you don't have to talk about it? Should I wait? Um, yes, maybe. Let's let's take the better together with uh, Anna, please, Anna Calori. Um, thank you for uh, for this really wonderful excursus on a long term history of capitalism, and uh, thanks to to Retzet and to everyone for for inviting me and participating in this. Um, I have a question that I think is going to bring us to a whole other Pandora box, but I hope uh, we, <laughs> we still have time to discuss that. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning the, the connection between uh, um, the abandonment of unfree labor and the end of uh, plantation capitalism and how much that in itself shaped uh, uh, how capitalism came to, came to be afterwards. Um, so if we extend then the question of, or, or the argument of co-transformation that Philippeer has uh, put forward between East and West uh, uh, much later on, then I was wondering if you could uh, um, expand or, or tell us more about how do you think that uh, decolonization helps to sh shape Western capitalism in the 20th century? Or do you see it as just a, a political development that somehow doesn't impact too much uh, uh, Western capitalism later on? Thank you. Yes, it's certainly in, in, in the Pandora box, I would uh, agree with you. As to the uh, comment uh, by Professor Kovac, I fully agree that these are uh, very important um, points. Uh, I did not uh, talk about it, not because I think they are self-evident, but I felt my so I felt very much under time pressure uh, and tried to be selective. But in my concept of industrialization, in my co concept of uh, industrial capitalism, uh, the points you mentioned uh, would be central. Technological change are uh, demanding a certain concentration of uh, production in order to use uh, new forms of uh, the steam power, for instance, or uh, the attempt to minimize uh, transaction cost and the possibility uh, to have the tools for minimizing transaction cost as another uh, reason for forming larger uh, enterprises. Uh, uh, investment, uh, and that means uh, the increasingly organic nature of capital. 
I, in a way, uh, I implied it, not because it's self-evident, because of a, but I think that the notion of industrialization and industrial capitalism um, uh, contains it. Uh, and uh, I think it is worthwhile, however, to make it explicit, which I, I, I didn't do. But it's uh, one of the reasons why uh, these decentralized forms of uh, uh, proto-industrial industrialization was increasingly replaced and verdrängt uh, by uh, centralized forms, the factory system, uh, etc. Uh, and it's interesting to see that probably these uh, opportunities of concentration of capital, of minimization of uh, transaction costs can be retained now, in spite of the fact that part of the production is re decentralized uh, in the sense of home office, uh, uh, telework, etc. So your point is important. Uh, and uh, I did not give it the degree of um, uh, of uh, attention which it deserves. Um, I'm sure that decolonization um, has meant uh, a lot uh, about uh, the change of uh, um, industrialization, post-industrial economies in the colonizing countries of the West. Uh, it's a debate on how much colonization itself before uh, uh, contributed uh, to the uh, economic success of the West, uh, as you know, and uh, to the extent that one stresses uh, the, um, I mean, the positive, the economically positive function of earnings on with the plantation economy and with slavery trade, slave trade and so on. As much as one stresses the economic positive effects of that on Western industrialization and Western growth, to the same extent one should then probably acknowledge that decolonization has a the opposite effect to sometimes. So this would be one line I would try to argue. But, uh, but secondly, uh, it seems that uh, um, forms of globalization have taken place over the last uh, half of the 20th century, which uh, uh, guaranteed new forms of internationalization and transnationalization. Uh, uh, very much in favor of economic growth in the West, uh, which uh, sh forms which made the colonial forms of globalization superfluous uh, or less important. Uh, so the more traditional forms of, of the colonial world have been abandoned and, uh, uh, and uh, emancipation took place, uh, but at the same time, new forms of transnational uh, dependency emerged, which may be at least as effective uh, as uh, colonial uh, uh, dependencies. So, I mean, these two lines, I would uh, probably try to argue and collect materials in order to see how far it leads you. Thanks a lot. Um, well, we are um, compliments again to Jürgen Cocker. We are still discussing after after two hours, and there's um, there's one more and last question. However, I also want to welcome our rector. Uh, thank you, um, Heinz Engel, for joining us. Uh, we are still in the course of the discussion. We have one uh, one uh, last question and and then an answer, and then we will uh, be very glad, of course, to. Uh, listen to your Grußwartin um, to celebrate, so to say, uh, the opening of Rezet also in these ways. Um, now, um, Janis, you had Janis Panagiti, does you have a question? Yes, yes. thank you. And um, I, will, I will try to be brief, given that the reg that director Engel is already here. Um, welcome from my side, too. Um, just one question 
maybe a selfish one, given yeah. that I, um, I myself migration and especially with migration in the context of liberal orders. Um, I wonder where you as a historian of capitalism um, and um, considering what you said about this, this changing relationship of, of state and market, uh, where you place um, the state, the capitalist state's position towards migration, um, assuming that labor, like people are at the end of the day, um, a factor of production, labor, which needs to move at the same time, we have this constant um, struggle with and against migration in many cases, in particular in recent years. And I wonder um, where you, um, how you would systematically place this in this uh, relationship of, um, of state and, um, and market, this very often quite pronounced anti-migration stance. Thank you. I'm sure you know much more about that than I do. But basically, since, as you say, from a strictly economic uh, point of view, uh, arriving migrants uh, are a resource, uh, a pr factor of production, of course, graded, differentiated by skills and uh, aptitudes uh, and um, matching uh, mechanisms between what they know and what is needed in the economy. But basically, this is, I think, the interest uh, uh, of business uh, to make it easier for migrants to come. And even in 2015, uh, I think, one can try to spot the influence business groups had in Germany on Mrs. when she decided in favor of a very liberal, liberale, very open uh, form of uh, migration uh, acceptance. It, I was at that time. I was amazed to see that the unions were not more skeptical against this uh, influx of labor power. Because after all unions, uh, the logic of unions activities over 100 years has been to limit uh, the number of available labor in a market in order to increase the, the power of those who are on this market. But in 2015, 2016, 2017, the major speakers of at least the German uh, uh, DGB unions spoke out in favor of uh, a rather liberal, uh, open uh, migration uh, uh, policy. And many states uh, in several parts of the, uh, in several, in, in different periods, or even the United States since the 1920s, and again and again, uh, uh, limit the access of migrants. And it shows that uh, in my language about the relationship between market and state, it shows the limited, the limitations of influence by business groups on government actors. Uh, after all, governments are in, uh, are, uh, like always influenced by many factors and there is so much uh, distrust in the uh, influx uh, of uh, foreign uh, uh, persons that uh, this becomes a political force and balances and overbalances the interest of business groups uh, which goes in the other direction. So along these lines, I would try to argue. And uh, again, this would be one of the examples showing I mean, nobody anymore really says that governments are just the uh, indirect forms of business uh, hegemony. But if uh, this, uh, the migration policies are, I think, an indicator showing that governments respond to very different interests. Okay, thank you, Alain. Uh, thanks a lot also for, uh, for this last response. and for participating so lively in our discussion, for being with us uh, two hours. Um, 
you know, again, I would like to thank you to congratulate for the birthday. I still refrain of telling the number because it is not visible, nor is it audible. Everybody can look it up in the internet, but it is around birthday. And well, I guess I have to tell one would never think that he went 80. So happy birthday. Uh, thanks for being with us. Um, thanks for this wonderful speech and discussion. And uh, ad multos annos. <laughs> thank you very much, Philip, and thank you. Thanks to everybody.